that happens every day. Right, and, and I think the concern, though, is with the w changing the contracts for these teachers is that it's something that will start to happen and potentially based on something even outside of the, the school setting, personal time, and all that. And, and I think that's the concern is that something that's been used rarely may now start to be used more often. And in, in, in my part of this, is in my concern is, is that it be, if this is gonna be something that's now part and parcel of a religious school, that it's something that is used consistently because I think there is a, a state interest there. And that's one of something that I'm trying to understand and, and trying to frame. I wanted to go back to Ms. Uh, Professor Griffin's point. And I think, um, you know, our challenge with trying as we go broader, I think we always want to start from a very broad perspective is we have two very core issues that seem to be butting against each other. One is this protection of religious freedom from the First Amendment stems from the Constitution, as was described. And then we have the other very core concept, which is around your civil rights, but in particular around your employment rights. And I guess as as our analysis has pointed out, where, where, they, where they have come to sort of a crux is around the ministerial exception, which is why we've been focused on it. If you didn't want us to focus on only the ministerial exception, exception, where, where would you want us to take a look at? Because I guess that's what we're, mm -hmm. we, we've been trying to figure out from a legal perspective, um, you have very, I mean, if you look at the broadest interpretation, like Justice Thomas's interpretation, which is once you create a school, once you create a religion, once you, you know, I could, I could go found a school tomorrow and call it a religious school, then I've pretty much allowed myself to not have to follow any of those laws. That's that's a potential interpretation. A, a more narrow interpretation as well, we don't want to get into every single definition of uh, employee and who they are, but as, as individual cases come up, then we'll take a look at it and kind of look under the hood and make sure that they are a minister or not a minister. So, you, so, so I guess for us, the, the challenge is, is, you know, as I'll not just say as a, as a lay person outside, I, I look at the institutions as these are in, you know, traditional employer-employee relationships. And these are things that are uh, not in common in any particular employee-employee relationships. Now, when you overlay the First Amendment part of it, I think that's where it gets very, very complicated. So maybe you can help us. Well, I think that. that if we go back to the general meaning of the First Amendment and what legislators can do under the First Amendment is the basic rule is Legislate laws that are neutral, like neutral laws of general applicability. That's the standard from Employment Division versus Smith. So you can't write pass legislation targeting a religion or targeting religious schools, but you can and have, right? The, a lot of California law, the contract laws, Mr. Carter, right? the labor laws, all those provisions, right? What you can do in contract negotiations, what labor law allows. So the legislature can pass neutral laws of general applicability. And that's to me where the morality clauses come in. Like, just what does California law allow as a neutral and general matter for everybody on the issue of morality clauses, right? Whether it's a church or a private employer or a public school teacher. And so your job is what are the neutral and general laws of the state of California? And have we covered the kinds of issues that arise in this setting, right? In the whole context of marriage equality and reproductive freedom and all these issues that are percolating across the country, right? Do, does, do, are our law, right? Our job is to make sure our laws are general and neutral. And then the second big thing that legislators do is they decide whether to exempt religions from the law, right? That's the huge thing. Religious institutions, it's a very hard question, right? So, so, um, so Mr. Byrne might say, well, a ch right, a church school is a church. And I'd say, well, but right, I overheard over here is maybe a school that has non-Catholic employees, you know, a whole, you know, a religious school that has students of all religions and teachers of all religions might not be a church. And a lot of what the legislature do is legislatively decide who gets accommodated. And I know, for example, in FIHA, there's the concern about rural religious hospital, hospital, you know, don't we need to keep hospitals? But even religious hospitals come under the law. But, oh, any plain religious group, they're out. And you say, well, who should be exempted, right? And so you say, well, what you'd have to be concerned about is what kind of regulations do we have for all schools? What protects all students, right? But, but we know from all the sex abuse and child abuse crises that everybody's got to follow the laws protecting children. Mm -hmm. 
right? There's no, re- there's no religious First Amendment exemption to that. And so it's what laws do we have that protect children in schools, that protect employees in the school, and are we willing to say that every, I mean, is it true as a matter of law that every school is a church and therefore they can do what they want? Or is it a school that has, that it brings in government money and has people of different religions and has teachers of different religions, you could regulate that differently. So that's what, if you get caught up in the ministerial exception, you'll be crossing the line, right? If you try to find the the ministerial exception, you'll be doing the court's job. And the ministerial exception is required by the Constitution. You can't define it. The courts have to figure it out. But you can, what, pass the laws that protect everybody, make clear what employers have to do. But but, but I guess, just to to go along that line, Mm -hmm. which is, um, we we could do that, but then we end up butting into this whole freedom of religion. And since these are religious organizations, it goes back to Mr. Berman's point, which is, you know, as an employee, as a parent, as a student, um, you, you knew this was a Catholic school or a Jewish school or a Muslim school. When you when you came, it wasn't this wasn't a hidden fact. This was fairly well publicized. The teachings are, are fairly well publicized, and so by uh, applying for a job there or applying for admission to these schools, you in and of itself have accepted that even if you don't necessarily subscribe to every tenant, that, that, that this is, the, these are the rules of the game. So, so I guess how, how would you, I guess, address that? Because you, again, there's no one forcing the students to go. There's no one forcing the, the teachers to go. There's no one um, forcing this on you. You could choose to go down to the public school or work at the public school down the street if you so chose. I mean, our nation is struggling with this right now at a mass level, especially in the era of marriage equality, right? I mean, I don't have to tell you that the the tension between what religious freedom means and what constitutional equality means is a question that's perplexing to every American. I guess what I would want to say is there's we never should think of religious freedom as absolute. We never should think, oh, we've got, and, and we, we re, and part of the tension in this is we respect religious freedom so much, and we want the churches to have freedom, and we want the schools to have religious freedom, that sometimes we lose sight of the idea that churches, religious actors, sometimes do bad things, right? They need to be regulated, right? There are laws that govern everybody. That's the message of Smith, and that we can't be afraid of saying that there's two sides of the story, right? That the anti-discrimination laws and religious freedom are equal constitutional values, and you can't just say religious freedom trumps one. So, right, I would be foolish if I pretended to have the answer to to how you strike that balance. But in my view, in, in this era, it's very important not to concede too much that religions and religious schools suddenly become free to violate the law, right? To, to make everybody ministers, to keep people from getting married, um, to keep people from using reproductive technology, right? That would be the risk. If you see religious freedom that you don't see, hey, religious freedom can be limited, right? The, it's not an absolute. If I could, if I could make two Mr. points. On, there, there was one point that seems to come from both sides of me, and that is that you know all, all the students aren't of the denomination and all the faculty are not of the denomination. <laughs> the California Supreme Court, in I think two cases, has rejected that notion as being relevant um, with respect to religious status. And that's the McKeon case and the Kelly case. Those were hospital cases, and uh, there were FEHA exemption cases, and the question was whether they qualified for the religious employer exemption. And the plaintiff said, well, wait a minute, they, you know, all, all their students, or all of their students, all of their patients are not Catholic or not Methodist, and all of their employees are not Catholic or Methodist. And the Supreme Court, in both cases, said that that doesn't really matter. The, the other thing is, is that Smith is really not the, necessarily the silver bullet. I, I understand Smith, and you've got generalized rules of general applicability, but that doesn't give you the right necessarily to legislate um, a law, say, for example, outlaw, outlawing morality clauses. And the reason is, is because if Smith were the law and overrode the ministerial exception, you wouldn't have had Hosanna Tabor. There you were dealing with a law of general applicability, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that law of general applicability, all the Smith, had to give way to the constitutional rights um, of the employer in Hosanna Tabor. Well, and what, but what we're dealing with, though, too here, are constitutional rights across the board, constitutional rights not to be discriminated against, constitutional rights of protection of, of freedom. And I think that's one of the things that's creating the tension. And as, as we're trying to sort through that, I don't suspect the legislature would or could pass anything that's going to touch or talk about the ministerial exception. But the, 
there is an, there was an issue when in an employment relationship when an institution arguably a religious institution and there's no sense of challenging that knowingly intentionally brings on somebody not of that faith and then has an expectation that they're going to perform their functions as written for that institution that's fine as a teacher the example a Jewish teacher a Jewish individual teaching at at a Catholic school is there a presumption then that that person will live their lives according to Catholic tenets when their their lives and their whole culture their history their beliefs are actually different that's there's a dichotomy there in truly a, a a purely religious school that's going to live by those tenets, bring in students who all believe, who are all a part of that faculty as well, then you get into a much broader school that is accepting the state's accreditation standards, that is accepting other students, that is accepting other faculty, and then trying to exert a level of control. I think that there's, there's a state interest in understanding how we can make sure that once you're acting as a broader player in the state of California, that maybe some of those rules do apply more broadly the, the, the general and, and non-specific rules that, that get put out. And I think that's, that's, one of the, that's obviously the question that's being, that's at the, at the heart of the conversation. Yeah. I was going to just add uh, briefly that if, even if the legislature were to create some law, neutral law of general applicability, it would still run up right against the ministerial exception. And it was addressed in the unanimous Supreme Court decision. I'll just read you very quickly. It said, the interest of society in the enforcement of employment discrimination statutes is undoubtedly important. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. But so too is the interest of religious groups in choosing who will preach their beliefs, teach their faith, and carry out their mission. When a minister has been fired, sues her church alleging that her termination was discriminatory, the First Amendment has struck the balance for us. The church must be free to choose who will guide it on its way. So I understand, I mean, the concerns. They're definitely legitimate concerns. But this decision was very clear in the protection of the rights of the church. Which, which um, opinion was that? That was the unanimous opinion. That wasn't one of the concurring. That okay, was the so that was just Justice Roberts' opinion? Correct. Okay. Um, but, but I guess, but even given that, as we drill, drill down, they're still, in, within the decision, they didn't define what a minister is. They, they right. went through the facts of her situation and said, well, then, yes, she is a minister, but they didn't say, this is what a minister looks like, this is what a minister does. There's, that, that's the part that's still very murky, right? I mean, I agree. Can, can I define a... Do, do, do the institutions have the ability to define janitors as ministers or uh, clerical workers as ministers or, um, you know, PE teachers as ministers? I mean, it's, it's just that, that's the challenging part that's not clear, which I think is creating a lot of uh, uncertainty. I agree. And if I had an easy answer for you, I would, I would give it. Well, we wouldn't be here if there was an easy answer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to me, let me just say that when I, the, the, the quote that I read to you, and I believe the uh, sort of direction that courts have gone after Hosanna Tabor, though there's certainly room for debate on that, is there's a focus on when employees are involved in a function that's um, inherent to carrying out the mission of the religious organization. And in fact, there is a case, and I'm terrible with case names, unfortunately, where a, a janitor was found not to be a minister. So the courts are now trying to figure this out and draw the line, but they said being a janitor is simply well, not... The, right, because inherently the legislature can pass laws of general applicability, mm. and the ministerial exception is an exception, as we talked about, to, to that law, and exceptions have bounds. And, and part of what we're trying to understand here, and I think what this conversation is, is understanding what, what those bounds are, and mm. when the actions by that organization claiming that exemption has gone beyond what they could or couldn't use it for, and the courts will, will decide that, and legislatures do have opportunities to try and frame that, that conversation. Mm -hmm. And of course they said they explicitly wouldn't address breach of contract and tort cases, right? That right. we expressed no opinion on how breach of contract cases would go, so those are, those are wide open. 
Yeah, they were looking specifically at that case.